Hello, good evening, everybody, and welcome to another um, podcast and YouTube uh, video. Today we have again Alex with us for another interesting talk, and uh, obviously we have uh, Robert with us as well, and hello. me, Diego. So, hello, everybody. And then Alex, um, you know, he's a very good friend of the ICO. And today we we ask him especially to talk something about this time of the year that we have, uh, you know, the odd calls and you know uh, all these uh, virus and bacteria that are coming into this time of the year. So any advice, um, osteopathic uh, uh, lifestyle, nutrition, something that we can use in in practice with our patients. So hello, Alex, how are you? I'm very well. Thank you for having me again, Diego. Round three. <laughs> Round three, yeah. <laughs> it's okay, such a pleasure. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's brilliant every time we have you around. So, good. Well, very good. I'm happy to throw a bit of enthusiasm into the wind. So, into yeah, the wind. Ready to go. Okay, um, so we were saying you know, about this time of the year that it's always a, a good time to talk about these, you know, these things that they come, the typical calls and, you know, or kids or, or patients that they come into the clinic and, well, it's something that we can always do with osteopathy and, you know, with lifestyle as well. So, you know, bring us some light into, into this. Okay. So, um, Actually, when we when we first started talking about sort of coughs and colds and viruses, it brings up that r really big <clears throat> subject of germ theory, doesn't it? Really, and germ theory, and um, takes us right the way back to the the origins, really, of sort of medical versus alternative, and the alternative and the medical viewpoints are very different because. Um, one is based on germ theory and one is based on terrain theory. One says that, you know, you are completely susceptible to the organisms outside of your body and it's all by chance whether you do or you don't come across them. And the other one, terrain theory, says that anything microzymally can grow out of effectively the ether in the in the in the world that we live in, given the right environment. Um, and so that original, as I say, always go back to the sort of nature cure. Nature cure spawned naturopathy, it spawned osteopathy and chiropractic and all of these other different scenarios. And right the way from day one, <clears throat> it is the understanding that the vital organism or the human being has the ability to through health and repair and to survive and the action of the body is always in the best interest of its host so we are always struggling to understand the intelligence or trying to understand what the person is doing but the body is always doing the best with what it's got um i was actually just um walking to get a charger and i i walked through the um i walked through the waiting room here that i have at home and i have a few different um, leaflets that I have for when people are sort of sitting waiting for sort of treatment and and the one at the top was a very old school one I think I got it you know way way back when it was 20 pence in the John Wernham College of Natural uh, Classical Osteopathy in the clinic in Maidstone and it was the old school introduction to osteopathy mm. when I see that little sticker it takes me back 20 years as if it was just the other day. And I can almost remember having these and just thinking, oh, I'm going to take a couple of those. They're going to be good for the practice. And here I am, and there's kind of, you know, stains and bits of stuff all over the front of it. But um, the <laughs> the uh, the words inside are, are very kind of old school, and you can hear them going all the way through the generations of osteopathy, back through naturopathy, back into the nature cure, into natural hygiene you know, several hundred and then into thousands of years, effectively. Um, and when I opened it up and there was the little thing of what is osteopathy, there was the bit at the top with the sort of mechanical part. And then just underneath it, there was a there was a question that it, it was saying osteopaths do not believe that all disease is caused by osteopathic lesions, but that a high proportion of these 
but this is more on the manual side. But I was just going to read this out, first of all, so that it's not me. It's just the teachings that I had 20 years ago and ones which are still just prevalent today. And when I was listening to these truths back then, um, you kind of had to take it on just the information that was given to you. So it says here it would be useful to dispose of a question of importance. What is the attitude of the osteopath? to microorganisms or germs as a cause of disease. So I'll try and read this relatively quickly. The osteopath is quite aware of the existence of organisms and appreciates that they are associated with disease and in ill health. So again, we're not, we're not saying, first of all, that they don't exist. They are part of the parcel, but it's not the entire picture. He knows also that bacteriologists no longer believe that germs are little animals with long whiskers and sharp noses. He understands that epidemics and infectious diseases result from dirt, from bad feeling, from, fe from bad feeding, sorry, and bad living habits. The view is held in many quarters today that infectious disease, acute infectious disease, is not necessarily a bad thing, and that the germs should not always be looked upon as destroyers but sometimes as scavengers engaged in the work of ridding the body of hereditary taints. Osteopaths therefore do not say that osteopathy can safeguard a person against infectious disease but they claim and justify the claim by clinical results that in persons who have osteopathic treatment Acute infectious diseases run a swifter and less distressing course. Children will probably catch measles, chickenpox, scarlet fever and so on. It appears to be the natural process of growing up and one would be wrong to insist that there is anything really bad in their doing so. The evil effects which sometimes follow do not necessarily follow the disease but might with equal or more justification be traced back to the so-called cure, i.e. the suppression of that disease by medical intervention. In the osteopathic view, children who are osteopathically fit can and do catch acute infectious diseases, but recover quickly and are not greatly distressed during the course of the disease and avoid complications and injurious after effects. There's another little paragraph. But these were just simple introductory concepts that start to take the process of understanding that acute illness and acute disease is a natural process to the human body. And we need to try and understand why, where, how and who it is appearing to rather than simply putting every single individual of every sex, age, and environment under the same umbrella so when somebody says i've got a cold or i've got the flu or i'm feeling a bit ill does that is that is that is that an actually an accurate description <laughs> can can we think of all of the people that we know that have a cold that it's just the same or is it a collection of various symptoms that the body is expressing during a time of distress that changes our lifetime and our lifestyle at the time because of the way that we feel. Hmm. And when we are not feeling so good, i.e. we're not able to um, carry on at our optimum or what we consider to be our health level, we consider that immediately because of the programming that we have, that this is wrong, it's bad, and we shouldn't ever have a period where we don't feel our best. And that's just not possible. It's not possible in life. It's not possible in development of the human body and the maintenance. It's not possible to think of pretty much anything else that is able to carry on without some form of repair or 
recuperation, whether that's an animal or a, or any form of living things, but it's also in the real world. Do, do, does our car never need to be put into the garage or do you never decide to repaint your living room or your remove some item from your kitchen no we we go through a process of restoration and repair and those things typically happen at certain times of year they happen in certain times of stress or re removal of stress or movement of a person or development depending on who they are what their history is what's happening to them where they live and a million different variables and so for starters i would just say that again with nature cure which is what i always go back on it's what we call an omnilateral approach to health and disease it's not reducing every single acute disease to one individual thing it is collecting all and as many variables as possible in the person to understand the incredibly complicated jigsaw puzzle that we have in front of us when we have a human being there. Um, and all of those, namely nine factors, air, light, uh, air, sun, water, diet, rest and sleep, spinal integrity, um, mental thought, removal of toxins, and one more that's just escaping me right now. But this combination of where we are looking at the different parts of the person's lifestyle in internal, external to the body starts to give us a pro process of looking at them and seeing what levels of vitality that we spoke about in a previous podcast, um, levels of health, levels of disease, um, history of acute crises, how they've been managed, have all of the acute crises become chronic. And so then we can start to get a bigger picture of the person. And we can maybe even predict when or when might that person go through an acute reaction. So this is kind of similar if we take the allopathic approach in the medical side. And we know that somebody has, for example, been on steroidal medication for a long period of time. Well, they have to be careful when they come off their steroid medication because um, the steroid, the corticosteroid, is inherently an immunosuppressant. It is stopping the body from its natural healing mechanism. It is reducing the inflammation and it is trying to tell that area of the body to be quiet and stop doing what it's doing. And it's not done through the understanding or the appreciation of why that organ or why that tissue or cell is struggling to deal with or having to over deal with a situation in the person's body. Um, when the person comes off a steroid, their tissues have been under suppression for a long period of time. And so people who are on long-term hard corticosteroids, we know, for example, in recent years, that those people have a very weakened immune system. Their body is not working very well. Why? Because they're under pharmaceutical intervention, which is secreting and delivering high doses of steroid into their body, which suppresses their immune system, and changes the met metabolism in their body in order to keep them going. And so people have to reduce their steroid very gently and they have to focus on health and high levels of hygiene in order to start to build them up. But quite often when they come off a steroid and their immune system has been suppressed, their immune system will reboot a little bit like your car that you've left in a garage for two or three years and you try and start the engine and it will blow a load of black smoke out the back and it can splutter and groan and stall and do these things until it literally gets the motor going. And it does that as we come out of immune suppressing, suppressing, suppressing. But we then can also realize, for example, that people are, 
on their own version of a of a of a long term steroid when they're in an environment of stress because the body secretes its own steroid doesn't it it secretes its own hydrocortisone and corticosteroid from the body under periods or long periods of stress so whilst it might be the initial stress is is adrenal and sympathetically driven the long term effect of long term stress in your life is for your body to start to produce corticosteroids from the adrenal cortex and that is effectively where they manufacture steroids they take those out of the adrenal glands of animals effectively so the reason i'm saying that is that when somebody is not on long term steroids but they're under long term stress and that stress is then removed they can go through a reboot for example so people who are going through marital problems or they're having a divorce people who are training for their phd children who are being bullied at school people who are just very excited about their new job opportunity but they can't sleep at night and they're working really hard it might be something that they love but they might be burning the candle at both ends and they might be suffering from a lack of water or suffering from a lack of sunlight or dietary or da, da, all of these different elements but they, they could also be living a really healthy life but they're just under a lot of mental stress and they're producing a lot of these self drugs from their own pharmacopoeia in their body which is again we have our own medical cabinet within our own body that's one of the principles isn't it of both it's, osteopathy and of nature cure which is it's, it's quite a primitive um system really isn't it it was kind of uh, um evolved with us i guess you know i don't know probably hundreds of thousands of years ago when we were um you know when, for when we had to run away from the, the saber-toothed tiger or uh you know a bear coming around the corner. and so it would would have this massive alteration in physiology you know the centralizing of of blood to uh around you know your heart and lungs and to your to your muscles and uh getting a uh your liver to release a lot of blood sugar into your into your circulatory system and uh, doing all sorts of things, allowing you greater focus, stopping yep. your appetite, stopping your um, libido, uh, increasing your, making you much more hypervigilant, you know, putting you in that fight or flight state, which you see on the, you know, the David Attenborough shows when the, um, the antelope is running away from the, for, from the lion. And it's that crazy life or death, 30 seconds that uh yes. that, that that antelope either lives and uh gets to you know eat yep. back on the prairie another day or becomes the lion's dinner and so it's that optimize op optimizing and prioritization prioritization of survival over rest and digest you know uh um and one of the interesting things when you watch those shows, you know, you see these animals and they sort of like they get away from the lion and they kind of do this sort of shake. Yeah. And then they start. It's like that disengages that fight or flight system, puts them back in rest and digest. And then they start eating again. Whereas we we we, we fortunately don't get chased by lions that much but living in the societies that we society that we do there's there's a kind of lower grade constant pressure isn't there that uh, there is. that, that we're under all the time so we don't get this proper cleaning and healing going on until we go on holiday you know yeah. something like that and, so and, and what i what i'd add to that robert you're absolutely right i mean absolutely actually to be fair like when I see that in the gazelle or see that in that, it, it's almost like a really big wake up call, isn't it, to them? They just jump mm. into action. And like you said, that is immediate. But it is it is very neurological at that time. Mm. It's a very it's a very fast, um, sympathetic release that is instantaneous. Um, but at the same time, almost as you say that the analogy I've got with the sort of corticosteroid is the elephant or the ze zebra that are that are on the sort of large mass migration um because they don't have any water and they don't have any food and so they are then partaking in some inordinate trek across africa or wherever it may be to get to somewhere else where they can just rest and have water now when you see those elephants or whatever animals in their herd trudging along 
you can see that it's like they're they're really running out of fuel and they're running out of water they've run out of energy and they're just they're really struggling and they've got their little calves of little babies that are struggling to keep up with the herd but they are under sort of not that adrenal kind of suddenly powered powered up effect mm -hmm. they're under the effect of like slow effective starvation they mm -hmm. they they're living on no food they're going into sort of just ticking over mode but they're also under a lot of stress they're under a stress in the environment and everywhere else and so they are kind of living on a they're living on a steroid mm. they've got that blue they've got the brown inhaler mm. going in each day as a low grade mm. anti inflammatory keep mm. going and they can be mm. on that low grade anti inflammatory all the time but then again, if a pack of mm -hmm. if a pack of hyenas or sort of lions rock up round the corner, then mm -hmm. up goes the blue inhaler, mm -hmm. and vasodilation occurs, the bronchial dilation occurs, and all of the spasms. But that is again a, a huge outlay of energy, isn't it? But it's there to survive. Mm -hmm. The other one is there to survive like long term, but it's low grade and it's just trudging along. Mm -hmm. So. Sometimes if we just had to kind of jump out of our seat and kind of go for a run or fight the intruder or something, you'd have that outlay. And it would probably give most people a bit of a wake up call out mm. of their drudgery mm. environment. But if the if the stimulation that gets you up, like, as we said, that we we're seeing, unfortunately, around the world, well, we've seen it all the time, but it's in prevalent at the moment that people are under continual adrenal stress that is life-threatening, It the nervous system is unable to keep up that kind of outlay of sympathetic information. It's just, mm. it starts to falter. Mm. So they, they, they're not trying to kick off the extra neurological impulses and the spasms. They're just, it would just falter. They would just crumple to a heap. And mm. so they have to have this injection of like, long-term steroid mm. and so again if those people who are on that when they come off it and they're like you said they go on holiday and they get the divorce paper through and they they get the job application and they you know they pass their phd the relief the weight off their mind that people will use these phrases allows the adrenal rug and the corticosteroid rug to be pulled from them mm. and then the body can go into to discharge and it can go into firing up that car again so it's quite usual if you if you have patients who are just trying to get to the point where they can go on holiday or just get to the point of half term or just get to the sort of summer holidays that those are the ones that we've really got to encourage trying to look at these different aspects of our life to try and employ as many things as we can to lighten the load and keep one as healthy as possible so that we don't suddenly have this effect of having the steroid and having the adrenal rug pulled from underneath us and what happens is we actually just crumple to the floor and there is zero there is nothing left <laughs> And is it, it is at that time as well that not only can the acute crisis come that it's necessary mm. and not only can it come at a time which we'll talk about, I'm sure, very soon, which is why is it happening now at this time mm. and seasons and all that kind of thing. Um, not only does it happen because it's the right environment, not only does it happen because they they have instigated a cause, but it is then dependent on the state of health of that host. And so it's how good your car is, how good your house is, how good your factory is going into a sudden earthquake or environmental disaster. How how long will it will it last given turbulent situations? Mm. And again, given recent years, we, we see that people who have pre-existing major chronic diseases do not fare well when the initial um, flood comes through mm. but those people who are relatively fit and strong and can swim and can move they either move out of the way of it or they deal with it without very little symptoms whilst helping mm. everybody else 
or they have, as that little pa passage just said, a minor acute inflammatory condition which passes quickly and then we just need to know and understand the factors which will help support it, why it's happening, what the process is, and that removes the fear. Mm. And once we've removed the fear, we have understanding. Once we have understanding and no fear, it's all dependent on the person and the time and the vital force and, and, and. But the fit once then then we have a um a structure in which we can see the beginning, see the end, and understand what is happening in the middle. Fear is an interesting thing as well, isn't it? Because so much is driven uh, by fear in, in in how how people respond. Um, oh, I have to have some antibiotics. I have to have some medication. I have to have my inhaler or or, or my steroids or 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 whatever. And so much of that is so much reaction is driven by fear, isn't it? Because uh, they think they're they're, they're sick. It's, and, it's absolutely, uh, absolutely. Uh, and it's entrained in us. It's mm. entrained in us in our environment, in our families. It's it's on the news. It's what you've read. Mm. It's what a lot of us have always known. Mm. And in fact, as you say that, I, I when I was making dinner this evening, I received a message from one of my um, lovely patients who I treat her and her husband. And I've um, been integral to their health journey. Mm. I've never treated their children, but I have held their parents' hand over the phone mm. on numerous different acute, mm. eliminative and inflammatory conditions for mm. the children. And um, the children manage it on their own, which is exactly mm. the same, but there's no ego involved because I'm not there giving them a little bit of treatment for them mm. to think, oh, golly, next time this happens, what are we going to do if Alex isn't here or someone isn't here mm. to give me treatment? Mm. And again, that's conversations that we've had before about let alone or the natural hygiene mm. side or the, the naturopathic side and, and also our insinuation or understanding that we got some treatment, then it got better. So therefore, mm. it was the treatment that got me better. Mm. Um, rather than the treatment was part and parcel of the process, mm. but the person got themselves better. better. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. But what she did was I got a call earlier today um, that was, oh, my, you know, child, um, child number A or B, whichever mm. one we were going to call him, um, was unwell and um, had a bad throat and didn't feel very well and the fever had gone up and, then they were pretty distressed and they were wailing around and uh, really uncomfortable and they weren't quite settled and and was it were they were they missing anything mm. did they need to do anything um they just wanted to touch base they wanted to touch base with alex mm. so in between my patients i left them a sort of three four minute message which just went again through the simples a little checklist of the things that they might want to check that they might want to know that the child is not in inherent danger. Um, and then a little simple protocol as to how to go about the rest of the day. Mm. And the message that I received this evening was, um, first of all, that he was doing much better in a little text, but then I got this voice note afterwards, which effectively said, it's so nice to have you on the end of the phone. <laughs> to just touch base with you. Mm. And as they said in the, you know, five or so years that I've known them, they've not used any cow pole. They've not used mm. any form of medication. Mm. But as she said, oh, just that fear is a bit of a weird one, isn't it? It crops up. The kids are tired. I'm tired. They're mm. all wailing. And my brain goes, am I going to need to use that cow pole again this mm. time? And what they needed was they needed to reach out for help. Mm. So they generally send a voice note. And then underneath mm. the voice note, there's a, this is a this is about an acute child, mm. so that I don't see one of the fifteen voice notes and just ignore it, and I just notice the child and pick it up. And it was there just to hold their hand and to tell them that they're going to have a bit of a rough day because they're going to be tired and they're going to mm. be at the at the dispose of their of their child. Mm. But going through the process, and this is all positive, and if it's mm. okay, and if it's no biggie, and they're a little bit this and that, then and we'll we'll go through all those kind of things probably mm. quite soon. 
And what she said was, it was just so nice. It reassures them. It just makes them go, okay, it's all right. And we just carry on. And then you go through the night. Well, in this case, it was just the day. But mostly it's hand-holding the person through the evening or the night. Mm. And they wake up the following day or it might, you know, and everything is much better. The storm mm. has passed. The sun has come up and everything's easier. And then quite often, you know, that following afternoon, it starts to drop. Or as she said in the voice note, well, it's going to be evening time. So as usual, I'm going to wait for the inflammation or the irritation and the elimination to kick off again at night time because it generally mm. does. Um, but thank you for being there and just being that word of like just bouncing off and just soundboarding. Mm. And that is, I think, what our process is. We don't have to be there to treat. It is great to be there in that reassuring presence that we can be. Mm. But one of the old, I don't know, quotes was something like, the best physicians are those people who can help the person without even seeing them or touching mm. them. You're just giving them advice. Mm. And that is, that, is, that is the thing. We can, we can understand what the body is doing and these simple symptoms that crop up with all different forms of acute conditions. Mm. And the great thing is the things you do about it are all the same, regardless what was happening. Mm. So it's not a recipe. It's not a complicated um, wizard's brew of variant different things that you need to concoct in order to give them. And I don't give salves and ointments and potions and pills. I don't give remedies. Mm. I just understand the process that the body is going through when it might need some form of extra support. Mm. But otherwise, you the health comes in getting them to a certain phase and then understanding it as an, an acute eliminative mm. healing process. And as long as it is that, um, that is the that is that is the way forward to whole new um, quantum jumps in the person's mm. health and development development, especially if they're a child. How do you recognise that that it's uh, that it's that it's a um, an acute eliminative healing event? Again, sort of time when when it's happening to them. How quickly it's happening to them, um, what's been happening to them recently again, are they being under stress? Have they been have they been ingesting foods that are healthful for them? Mm. Or have they been going crazy because it was Halloween a couple of weeks ago and yeah, they've still got yeah. three bags of sweets underneath <laughs> their bed that they will not give up because they mm. went trick-or-treating. Mm. Um, In the and rain then, this and year. Then, and, then, and then the week later, they went to fireworks night and they had mm. loads of those other sweets and those other things and there's mm. loads of other treats that come in around that sort of period of time alongside all of the other things that are happening in the mm. environment and with school and, and, and. So mm. then we have to know, like, you know, is the process of the body running a course that seems natural or is it going out of hand quickly? Mm. Um, again, this is where we come to, you know, fevers and, those kind of things, because, you know, like, again, if you if you if you take an acute eliminative effort, whatever, whatever you want to call it, whatever infection, whatever cold or flu or virus or thing that you. That you have that you enjoy having a complicated name because it externalizes the responsibility from you, but to something else that, well, you're just unlucky. Mm. The body's effect is the same. The body is going through an eliminative effort and therefore it uses the organs of elimination to remove detritus from the body. Mm. And those organs that are eliminating are just like a factory. We mm. have several pieces of machinery in our factory that removes trash from said factory. Mm. 
And at certain times when the factory is working really hard, there's a lot of trash. <laughs> and so you've got to employ some extra members of staff to get that trash out or your mm. factory is going to start filling up with waste. Mm. And when you have waste building up, you start to have some forms of sanitary conditions. You might have some kind of animals or mold or or things growing in the factory and so you employ people to get that trash out the building so let's just let's start with that one because that's a good pro that's a good point isn't it to to do it what are the organs what are the factory machines that take rubbish out of your body mm. your skin your lungs your kidneys your liver and your uterus if you're a female. Um, now, why don't I say the digestive system? Why don't I say the GIT or the digestive system? Well, that's a sort of little conversation. I like to have a little dispute I have with you know within the profession when we look at them, yeah. because the digestive or the digestive tract from your mouth to your anus is a pipe on the inside of your body, and the food, whilst it's in that pipe, from when you go when you eat your food to when you go to the toilet and defecate, that food is still outside of your body. Mm. But if it's broken down in the tube and absorbed into the, into the body through the mucous membranes of the small intestine or within the digestive system, it's absorbed into the body, yeah? Yeah, and then, then dealt with through those other things that you just listed. Exactly. Mm. And so when you're fasting or when you're in acute disease, you might not eat food for a while because you've lost your appetite and you don't want to eat. And you may still defecate several days or weeks after you've stopped ingesting food. But generally, your body will not break down loads of tissue in your body and then push it into the tube mm. in order to break down. So you don't defecate cellular matter <laughs> in a sense mm. you do produce mucus and you do produce some form of mu mucosal um goo um mm. for example if you ate a very hot chili in your mouth or you ate some stuff in your stomach that was burning you would salivate wouldn't you you would insalivate huge amounts or dribble huge quantities if you've ever seen some stupid thing where people try and see how hot a chili they can eat and what happens to them they will very often vomit and they will often very much um have mucus coming out but they mm. will be often and when in a period of distress where well, the person is voiding or mm um purging the food that's already in their system but it's mm. not part of their cellular tissue mm. and extra mucus um, into those tissues does occur but it's normally through trying to protect or stop the body absorbing mm. the stuff that's in the tube because it doesn't want it going into the yeah, body yeah, yeah. Okay. so then we're back to the skin being on the outside and the kidneys being on the inside and in the naturopathic and osteopathic things in the past the skin was considered your third kidney mm. because it breathes so much you know you've got your you've got your lung tissue you've got your you've got your skin but your your um your kidneys when your your kidneys and your skin seem to work in in unison um the liver, like you said, does remove toxic toxins from the bloodstream. Um, so it does filter those. And it does appear that there is some kind of elimination that can occur through the bile as the bile, the gallbladder, just squeezes mm. pretty as, as acidic acidic bile into the into the into the duodenum. And mm. again, that could be considered some form of little bit of elimination in there, but it's just that remembering that if you're vomiting or you've got diarrhea or explosions from either end, that's not necessarily healthful elimination. It is purging of the, body, of the, 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 the things that are inside of you that are not being able to be digested, that are being maldigested and producing a lot of nitrogenous and waste that the body doesn't want to deal with that on top of what it's got. <laughs> And because it's closed down the digestive system, because it's diverting that energy to these other organs of elimination and the metabolic rate to produce a fever that, again, we'll get to in a second. 
um, yeah. it just decides to close that part of the factory down. So half of the factory gets closed, i.e. the bit that's taking in and getting rid of raw materials. Yeah. And we stop the door at the front and we stop the door at the back and we deal with the factory on the inside. And all of the people go around removing waste and hair and stuff off the floor of all of the machines and give it all a really great clean. Yeah. And the cleaning and those people are the skin, the lungs, the kidneys, the liver, and sometimes the uterus in a female that can be used for extra monthly elimination through the menstrual cycle. Mm. Um, so to just give a little bit of a little bit of a, a context to that, those organs are the same whether you are me, us guys here. Or a monk living a perfect lifestyle up a up a hill, um, breathing pure oxygenated air and living an organic farm and meditating part of the day and yogaing the rest and living a pure lifestyle. They still have skin and lungs and kidneys and liver. Why? Because those organs are there to eliminate cellular metabolic breakdown which is a daily event. You can't stop doing it. Tissue Tissues are breaking mm. down in your body all of the time. And those organs generally deal with it mm. um, without any effect or without any problem. Yeah. But when you have an increased endogenous and endogenous, like outside and inside production of toxic matter or cellular mm. breakdown because you've been badly injured, or because you're taking stuff in from around and outside of your body that you shouldn't otherwise do, your body can decide to have to work harder with one of those organs. Mm. And it can use those organs um, individually, so generally managing the system or the environment. But there are some times, especially when we become ill in this constitution that we're talking about, colds and flus mm. and everything else, that there's is not just like one organ, it, you know, eczema or asthma is different to having a cold, isn't it? An acute eliminative effort. And so when that happens, when an acute elimination happens, the body is using all of these organs, all of these systems at once. But it needs a general, it needs a general sort of worker. It needs, it needs somebody who's in charge of everything, everyone. And that is your constitution. And so what that person is good at doing is just directing everybody with a loudspeaker in the factory. And they say, close the gates. Mm. Oh, nothing will come into this factory. And that is the loss of appetite. Mm. That is the removal of any form of desire to eat. And water tastes nasty. And the idea of grapes or apples is horrible. And other food is can't get in it. Even kids will turn away ice cream and crisps, even when their parents are thinking, well, look, if we just give you some form of food, you might be stronger. But the body is really good at just saying no food, no produce through the gates. In fact, we'll work so hard to please our friends and our family or our parents that we will eat some of these foods. And we'll generally only eat the foods that have to happen to bypass our natural taste buds. So they have to have things with lots of kind of extra sugars or additives in it. But very often it will then make the child or the person extremely nauseous and very yeah. ill feeling. Sometimes until they then go and vomit all of the food back up again and you yeah. go back to square one. So the general foreman says, close all the gates and nothing goes in. Number one. Number two, it says, send, send all the people who are working in the normal digesting mode, who are bits on the who are who are on the conveyor belt that's taking the food from the front gates or the produce into the factory. Since there's nothing coming in the front gates, let's take all of those people and let's put them on the other on the other machines that do get being used. So we get total lethargy. We've not got any appetite. We've closed those gates. But we also get completely lethargic because all of the energy is diverted from our muscles and diverted from the rest of our brain or all of these things. And it's they're directed towards the skin and the lungs and the kidneys because they need to work harder and we want to get it done quickly, efficiently, 
and properly. Which is what Little John would have uh, described as hyperphysiology. Exactly. Hmm. And it's, it's kind of the thing that you kind of look at. I don't know why it makes me think of like, you know, you go to Japan or different places when they have a problem with the roads and they just send everybody and all of the truck, they get it done really quick, you know, like they just build a motorway, they re-tarmac it in a night. Whereas just here, you've just got these like three-point light systems and there's just like a bucket on the floor and there's just got hundreds of them around all of our cities and everyone's going mad with the cars. But we're just Why don't you just deal with one area at a time and focus all of your effort on like breaking down, rebuilding, cleaning, and then disappearing? Yeah. And that's the same with the body. Yeah. So close down the gates, send everybody over to the organs that need it, but then we need to like we need to vamp stuff up because we're going to get it done. We're going to work all night. We're going to get this done quickly, and so we're going to like pump some music going, and we're going to give all of those workers some kind of caffeinated drinks. Even though we're not suggesting that people take caffeinated drinks, right? But the idea is is that what the body does is it produces mm. a fever, and a fever is there to increase the metabolic rate. Mm. It's there to <clears throat> feed up those workers on all of the different manufacturing kind of things and to make them work really, really hard and really, really fast and think really quickly about what they're going to do because they're working so hard. And that's basically it. Mm. We close down what we eat. We lose the appetite. We get completely lethargic. We conserve all of our energy and we redivert our vital energy force to the organs of elimination that then remove breakdown of cellular debris as well as toxic matter out of the body under an environment where you have an increased metabolic rate and you have to have a fever you have to have a temperature for that mm. you can't do it without a fever or a temperature mm. and you can't do it if you keep feeding the person mm. and you can't do it if you keep them active mm. if you keep the gates open mm. and you keep food going in and you keep the division of labor unsound and you don't feed the workers that are working, and you don't conserve energy, what happens is stuff hits the fan and the factory starts to break. Mm. And that is the diversion of if we understand these simple principles, you can deal with almost all manageable, basic childhood illnesses, as well as almost all adult basic illnesses under mm. the same premise mm. but the great thing is is you don't have to open a pharmacopoeia and try and work out exactly mm. what different type of remedy you need mm. and you don't need to externalize the what are very complicated natural laws that we are mm. struggling to simplify into this kind of analogy as if that is it because the the, the um inherent um, knowledge of the body is just is so incredible it's mm. like how how you know we're here trying to like philosophize about it or trying to make it into like simple nuts and bolts that people can understand but the thing is is your body knows what it's doing and why mm. it's doing it. and if we just don't understand it and we try and stop it yeah we're really messing with a very com very complicated intelligent computer and you're basically mm. saying no, my computer, this doesn't know what to do. I'm going to do yeah. this. Yeah. And then we wonder why, yeah. like, it breaks mm. or why the initial suppression of the symptom that gave us the peace and quiet yeah. that we wanted so that our kid would not be crying or yeah. bothering us or our partner wasn't moaning or our patient wasn't in pain. We understand that afterwards, we just basically went in and we hold a halt to the foreman and we mm. just said no 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 you don't know what you're doing mm. there's no one in this factory knows what they're doing mm. i want to tell you what to do mm. you definitely need to eat some food and you definitely need to go back to work and those mm. guys shouldn't be over there they should be over there mm. and then all hell breaks loose mm. it's, it's it's interesting isn't it because um you know we we with all the um, modern science that we have, we still don't really understand that that yeah. kind of um, brainstem 
sickness organization of sickness behavior through the neuroendocrine immune system you know so it was you know so initially it was a oh it's your endocrine system and now it's your immune system oh it's, it's your nervous system so so then they amalgamate those things thinking that they're all separate things in in the first place um and, and call it your neuroendocrine immune system but it's we we have such a limited understanding of that and it's interesting because that that hyperphysiology and the fever must take a huge amount of energy to to actually orchestrate mustn't it yep absolutely and that's why probably the biggest blocks to healing or cause are the friends and family that are around the person in the first place yeah they're absolutely and in all of the books that's what it will be whether it's Linlar or it's benjamin or it's shelton or it's different people weren't of any one of these people normally it is get the people who are panicking and get the people who don't understand what's happening out of the room mm. because they're changing the energy energetics in the room and they're not instilling confidence and they're trying to make the person behave differently because mm. of them mm. because they're worried because, because they're the worried yeah. and they're yeah. worried and it and it comes to a, another point which i i definitely wanted to wanted to make um which is really important because all of this comes down to we don't like to people we don't like to see people suffer. Sorry, I lost you then for a second. We, Could you we just don't, repeat we, that? We, we don't like to see people suffer. No. And the simple fact is, is <clears> that when someone is going through an a a a, 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 a healing state or an acute eliminative state they are suffering mm. <laughs> but some of the old school naturopathic or nature cures would say you know right suffering <laughs> they're suffering for the pleasures in life yeah yeah well you, you you have to go through suffering to experience pleasure and, you do uh, and you also need to you know you need to you need to deal with the fact that your house is an absolute state when when you've like <laughs> not got a bedroom and you've got a load of workers inside of it but why mm. do you do it and why do you put up with those people you mm. put up with them because you want your like new brand new kitchen and your brand new bathroom mm. and you want yeah. your place painted and <clears> no <throat> it's a hassle to take all of your stuff out of mm. all of the kids bedrooms and like lift up the floor and mm. make it all horrible and dirty and get rid of the mold and then mm. put new screens down and la 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 la, la. Anyone who listens to this, who's done any form or themselves or had any form of restorative work done on their house, understands that if you just didn't know what was going on and you went round to someone's house and they were in the middle of like um, some kitchen renovation yeah, yeah. and that they didn't tell you anything yeah. about it and you just went, yeah. well, this is wrong. Whatever's yeah. going on in here yeah. is wrong. You should yeah. leave this house. You should yeah. stop this. Whoever yeah. the people, who's this person in the kitchen? Look what they've done to your kitchen. Yeah, you they're ruining your home. house. <laughs> you should send them home. So the person just says, okay, okay, all right then, all right. All of the workers, get out. Mm. Everyone in the kitchen, get out. Mm. Why? Because we've looked in the kitchen. The kitchen's a mess. The ceiling's mm. come down. You've ripped all the cupboards mm. off the wall. And there are mm. three Polish dudes standing inside there. <laughs> and you say, what have you done to my kitchen? Get out. Yeah. But then we've got a kitchen that's in a complete mess and who who's going to know what to do with it? Mm. So if you've told them to go home and you've mm. pharmaceutically removed the symptoms from the body because mm. you didn't want any of the suffering, mm. well, you've got to deal with it now. Mm. So when you've got to deal with it, you're the same person. But this time when the pipe bursts in the corner, well, you don't have the plumber there anymore. Mm. And you've got a jet of water coming out. So the analogy is like when you, when the fever then spikes again, but you've already given it four doses of cow pole, and then mm. the next time it do, it goes really high because it really wanted to do a job, mm. and you weren't listening to it, mm. and you kept suppressing it until it says, right, I'm going to do give it one last effort. But this time, it's got lesions in the upper back, it's got lesions in the body, it's run out of energy, it's not got anything left, and then it becomes a malfunctioning. So rather than thinking, I'm going to have a nice temperature that's going to go bolt upright, it's going to hit its peak and then I'm going to drop the other side. It goes up, but then it gets stuck. And then the body can't give off the body heat. 
and it can't send the the blood to the superficial circulation and can't give off the heat. So then it starts to cook you. And then the person might have the once in a 10,000, however many thousand complicated complications that end up with the, the febrile convulsion, right? Mm. That's the one that everybody, basically every single adult that gives their child cowpaw with a fever is to do with the fact that they think if they don't do it, their child's going to have a seizure. Mm. Really, that's the underground thing. And the less underground thing is my child is just really driving me up the wall and I've yeah. got things to do and I've got to sleep tonight because tomorrow yeah. I've got work or yeah. I just am fed up with their moaning. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I was just going to say, I don't know if I interrupt them, do. No, no, but, no, don't. Uh, the, one of the, the things that really concern me when, you know, we are suppressing and keep suppressing kids uh, temperature or acute illnesses is what what happens with these kids when they you know they become 16 20 30 you know what what kind of illnesses or, or problems we are building up in the in in that system well generally it's just getting more and more chronic isn't it so mm, exactly. what starts off with eczema as a child you know let's let, very very standard no, this will not work for everybody who listens to this, but it might ring some bells for some people. Child starts off in the early years with eczema or some form of irritable skin. They went to the doctor. They got a load of hydrocortisone creams. They fought the skin conditions on and off through the early years. And then maybe like six or seven, the skin got much better, but the eczema disappeared and then they got asthma. And then in the seven, eight, nine, ten year old, they were just kind of suffering with their asthma. And this time they didn't have steroid cream on their skin anymore, but they had the brown inhaler and they were at games with the blue inhaler. And every day they're taking the brown inhaler. And then when they get to the sort of early teenage years, sometimes the asthma drops away, but then they get colitis. And then mm. they start getting like um irritable bowel syndrome stroke ulcerative colitis stroke crohn's or some kind of like ulcerating angry skin that used to originally be the skin on the outside of the skin and then that got stopped down so the irritation went to the skin on the inside of the mucous membranes and the lung and then that got stopped and so then it went to the mucous membranes of the digestive system and meanwhile at the same time as that kind of thing happening the ear infections or the little throat or chest in throat infections that the kid used to have, well, they're not throat infections anymore. They're like tonsillitis. And then the tonsillitis is becoming like strep B all the time. And it's really, really rough. And they're having a lot of antibiotics. And then their tonsils are so bad that their tonsils get removed. Hmm. Hmm. And, um, and then the cough that used to be a bit like, laryngitis is now bronchitis so they've now got kind of asthma stroke bronchitis once a year but actually this last year it ended up being pneumonia or this last year it ended up being pleurisy hmm. oh poor poor little jack or jill you know they're really in a they're in a really poor state now but then at the time when they're in their teenage years and they're on maybe some steroid pill for their ulcerative colitis or Crohn's they then like graduate and they go to uni and when they're going to uni they're suddenly like not being fed by mum and they're drinking like a fish um, and they've joined the student union and they're like working in the day and they're partying at night and their diet's gone out the wall and they're around a load of other people in kind of more unhygienic circumstances but their body kind of really runs out of juice now. And so suddenly it becomes chronic fatigue or it becomes ME. Mm -hmm. Or bless them, some of them end up with like lymphoma or some kind of like serious like, oh, it hit so-and-so when they went to uni. Or they had such a bad viral infection that they ended up in hospital for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, and then once you're into your 30s, now you're into like just long term sort of chronic conditions if you've gone through that. Now, mostly a lot of those times, most of those standard kind of histories that I'm talking to you about generally have allopathic consequences to them. So each and every one, they go to the doctor and they come back with something 
And what they come back with is not the allowance and the understanding of this factory environment and not telling them just to drink water, go to bed, turn the phone off and sweat it out, but to take some form of anti-fever medication or antibiotic or suppressant steroid, all of which goes back to our conversation when it first started, that when you are really stressed, you could have a banging headache, you could have a really bad indigestion of your tummy, you could be extremely lethargic and you could be not feeling very well at all. And you step out into the road with your three-year-old little kid or just on your own and some bus come past you as they hoot the horn and the wind goes gust as your face as the truck goes by and you get the biggest shock of your life. And as you've got to do this and you reach for your kid and you realise that you're actually OK and the bus didn't hit you, but you really had the panic that the kid was going to fall off the side of the building or something. That thing that makes you just whoa, that rush of heat and adrenaline that we were talking to you about. Almost instantaneously, all of those symptoms just go away. Your headache's gone. You have total amounts of energy you could pick up a car off your newborn baby you can run a mile you're just ready you are ready because all of that systems have flooded in mm. you know so quite, quite remarkable isn't it yeah absolutely mm. and so we we the sa- those same those same drugs that our body can produce we can mm. go to the doctor and get mm. those drugs mm. to take away the symptoms yeah, yeah. But it's got nothing yeah. to do with the cause. Mm. It's got nothing to do with the mm. process. It is just simply mm. removing the symptoms. So then again, we come mm. back to how this kind of re- this kind of thread started, which is mm. suffering. Mm. I remember the difference, or trying to get the difference, and I'll probably get it wrong. But the difference between empathizing and sympathizing with a patient is very mm. important for a practitioner. It's really important mm. for surgeons or different people. I don't really know how some people are able to function in a hospital. Well, I do actually, because they really believe in what they're doing to the patient. You've got to believe in what you're doing to the patient and you've got to believe in what the patient in our case is doing for themselves. Mm. And if you understand what the patient is doing for themselves, you can understand the feelings that they have. You can appreciate the fact they're not feeling very well. Mm. You don't really feel sorry for them. Mm. you are empathizing with what the condition they're going Mm. through but you're not sympathizing with them Mm. because if you sympathize with them you just want to take it away and you just feel Mm. so sorry for them and Mm. oh poor you is it's oh it's so so sad this is happening to you Mm. which doesn't instill confidence and basically Mm. tells them that what's happening to them is wrong Mm. Whereas if you tell them, like, this is really exciting, or if they're lucky enough to know this information before, they'll call you up and they'll, mm. in the last little bits, they'll be like, oh, I feel so rough today. I'm really excited. It's finally <laughs> happening. The acute crisis is here. Mm. Oh, what's happening? Oh, I feel awful. Mm. I feel awful. Well, why do you f- sound so great? Well, because you've been talking to me about this for ages. Mm. You've been getting me ready for this. Now I'm ready. Well, what are you going to do? Mm. I can't wait. I'm going to crawl into bed. I'm going to turn my phone off. Mm. I'm going to take two big bottles of water with me so I don't mm. have to get out. I'm going to even put a bucket next to the bed mm. so I can either vomit or pee without going to mm. the bathroom. Mm. I'm going to close the curtains. I'm going to put my eye mask on. I'm going to put my earplugs in and I'm going to try and sleep because I'm so tired and I'm so full. I don't even want to listen to music. I definitely can't read. And I know that you would say, just put the film away for a while and just Mm. pass out. And they appreciate it and they know what's coming. And so when they know what's coming, they get excited about it. Mm. And then they don't need anyone looking after them. They don't Mm. need it. In fact, if they tell their mum and their mum comes around, oh, I made you some soup. Oh, I brought Mm. you some chocolate and some Lucasade. That's what we used Mm. to have. Or maybe we should do that. Come on, if you get up, if you just come downstairs and have some food, maybe you'll make you feel better. I don't Mm. really want to do it, mum. I'm over here. No, come on, come on. This will will make you feel better. I don't. I've got no appetite. The smell of it's making me feel Come on, come on. You know, it's the same cycle we're going on. But if you just leave them, like mm. you would leave an animal that mm. has crawled into a like a bush because they've got injured mm. and they've broken its leg, 
you'd just leave it, wouldn't you? Right. If you found a snake curled up really hot with its skin shedding off, you wouldn't go, ah, wake the snake up. The skin's falling off, would you? You don't go breaking into a cocoon when a like caterpillar is turning into a butterfly. Let it out. Let it yeah, out. It's well, stuck in on, there. It's like stuck. It's <laughs> hot. It's, hot. it's suffering. You just understand the process. This is yeah. the same. Mm. The only difference is how much can the person tolerate it? Mm. How much can you tolerate them? Mm. That's really what it comes down mm. to. Mm. So I'll give a great analogy that I try and use for everybody with all mm. acute diseases. You don't know what childbirth is. Mm. Never experienced it. You don't know what it is. And you walk into a house one day and right there on your living room floor is a laboring woman who is about to give birth. Mm. And they are making a racket and a noise and they are breathing and they are panting and they are screaming and they are sweating and they are red faced and they just look like, <laughs> ah, you know, and most guys might be in that state where they're just like, I don't know. Is this all right? Is this OK? Yeah. Right. If the woman knows, if the if the female understands what childbirth is, if they've mm. been coached in it, if they've done their hypnobirthing, if they've done mm. different things and they've got less fear, mm. they can cope with levels of pain that us guys are never going to be able to experience and mm. deal with. Why? Because they understand that they're pushing a baby out of themselves and mm. that it's not going to be easy. And that there's going to be some heat involved. There's definitely mm. going to be an increase in metabolic rate. Mm. They're, they're definitely going to be hot. And they're definitely going to be focused just on that. They mm. are not going to be bothered with anything else in their mm. environment. And if you ask them anything or you bother them anything other than that, you'll either get slapped or shouted mm. at or mm. thrown out the room. <laughs> <laughs> because you are not understanding what their inherent knowledge is telling their body. Mm. They know what to do. And what mm. we, they don't need to do is to be told to lie on their back mm. or mm. told to do something that they don't want to do. Mm. You just understand the organism and most independent midwives and people who have birth babies not mm. in a hospital will be sitting in the corner of the room and knitting mm. to keep their hands busy and mm. to stop touching the patient. Mm. And they That's sit it. there and they knit. And I remember that from our independent midwife, that they knit little hats mm. for the baby and they knit little things to keep their hands busy. But mm. whilst their hands are busy, they are just watching quietly. Mm. And they are watching the organism in front of them because they become hyper vigilant hyper aware of the changes that are happening not only inside and on the outside of the female but in the energetics of the room and they know when the mum might be saying i can't do this anymore i'm i'm done i can't do it i i've reached the end this is it i can't do it and then they turn and they look at you and they go it's just about to happen like yeah. Mm. going through transition this is it mm. and that's the time when you need to hold that your partner's hand or whatever your other hand mm. or your daughter's hand or whoever's there with you and you need someone saying breathe it's okay we've got mm. you you're safe and then you just go through that other side and you're out and you've got a baby mm. but if somebody else comes in and they've got no knowledge of this and all mm. of this stuff is going on then you're just going to think, oh, my God, who is here? Someone help, 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 help mm. this poor woman. Help, help mm. their suffering. And mm. the woman might be going, no, no, shh, shh, leave it alone. Like, leave me alone. Just go back out of the room. No, 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 You something's wrong with you. You are making a lot of noise. You woke mm. me up. It's really noisy. You just, you look terrible, love. You are mm -hmm. white. You're white and you're hot. You're, mm. you're sweating and you're red and your eyes are dilated. Mm. I think you've got some foam in your mouth. Like, <laughs> you do not look good. Mm. Someone needs to stop this. And mm. people will call people in to stop it. Mm. And they do, don't they? They stop it by loads of ways. And you can take drugs and you won't mm. feel anything. And you'll be lying on your back and you mm. can be reading a magazine and listening yeah. to some la 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 yeah. until they just cut you open and take the baby mm. out. You're completely mm. unaware. Mm. 
Now, look, I want to make a really clear point. There is no judgment from me of anybody who decides to do anything. Mm. That's really important. It's really yeah, important, it's important for my patients. It's really important for anyone who listens to this. Please do not feel any judgment or guilt or anything if you mm. have chosen something that was right for you mm. but doesn't appear to be right for what I'm saying. This is that is is not meant to be. Mm. I'm fully 100% condone or I, I applaud people's own decisions. Just the decisions need to be made under understanding. Mm. And if you want to go one way or another in your childbirth, for example, and you want to go a different way in managing your own illness or your mm. child's illness, that's up to you. Just trying to offer understandings so that it might change one out of 10 or 10 out of 10 people mm. who listen to this to say, that sounds right. Mm. What, he's, what he's saying sounds right and if it sounds right i might need to get his number mm. or i might need to call one of these crazy dudes who are talking like this because they can help me next time i go through an acute crisis mm. just like the woman who gave the phone call today they needed their hand held at a mm. certain point and they needed to just have a checklist they mm. needed somebody in the room with the dad who was panicking with their wife who was mm. birthing but the dad hadn't read any of those books mm. and the dad was medically orientated mm. and the dad fell asleep in all of the hydro, you know, hypnobirthing lectures and they didn't, they missed all of it. Mm. And what they don't want is they don't want their, their partner suffering mm. and they will do anything to stop it. The problem is, or the benefit is, a laboring woman, when they know what's going on and they know what they want to do, you are not going to stop them. Mm. But you are going to stop a child and you are going to stop a baby because they don't understand mm. and you will overpower them and your fear will take away their own power. Mm. So when it's an adult looking after their baby, toddler, adolescent, child or whatever, they feel responsible for mm. the suffering of their child hmm. and so the thing will be well can i just give them a bit of cowpole because they seem to be in so much pain and they seem to be suffering oh their coughing is really bad they're, this is really bad there's they're, they're really unhappy so can i just bring their fever down a bit can i take it away <laughs> the answer is yes you can but you're going to be messing with the factory and you don't know what you're doing. So quite often, and I've done this within my family and the family people who listen to this will know that I've said to them, I will be there and I will stay by the bedside through the night with you. But if you start taking medication, I'm going home because hmm. it's now going to start to create diversions and alarm bells in 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 this car crash that's happening which is not going to follow normal rules <laughs> and mm. when you start intervent creating intervention with a patient with pharmaceutical medication you are chemically changing mm. what the body process is doing mm. and then that is when the complications start mm. if you've got a patient and they're under and they're undergoing normal physiological things and you've you know who they are mm. or you know roughly what's going on with them or you do the case history or you can find out how much suppression they've been under and what their lifestyle like what's going on with them you can get a pretty good idea mm. but once you've got a kid who is like under is taking loads of paracetamol and taking mm. loads of cowpole and you want to try and monitor them and manage their fever through the night i'm like no you, you choose that way you go you go to the hospital next time that can, yeah. you know the case because you're, you're you're taking the responsibility and the inherent intelligence of the organism and you are just removing it and what you are then left with is a train crash you're you're, you're left with a body that has got no foreman has opened all the gates to the yeah. factory and nobody knows what's going on and that's when accidents happen yeah. and that's when febrile convulsions happen yeah. it's when Things escalate and they end up. And it can be the same when you start feeding them. Mm. It came when you start stimulating them out of bed. 
and you stop the things that you're watching, i.e. the pain, the inflammation, the lethargy, the heat, mm. the vitality, the, the ability to communicate, the ability to move, the shivering, the heating, the, all of the stuff in the patient, because this is not just by not taking medication, you're just like, la, 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 I'm going to take your top off and dance around the fire outside and like, you know, pull a few crystals out. You, this is science kind of, you're yeah. really, you're really looking at all the different variables. But if you've got loads of people in a hospital ward and they're all doing that, what happens is you just shut them up. If you've got people in a nursing home, they get on opiates and they get on everything because it just drugs them. It just makes them quiet. It just, yeah reduces their vitality and as you reduce the vitality you reduce the expression mm. so once we can understand first of all that the suffering and the pain or the inflammation is all part of the process mm. and it's lectures in itself this isn't something that you just can just take it straight by means because there's loads of nuances and there's loads of variables in this but once you understand the premise you understand the process if you smash your finger with a hammer and it is bleeding at the beginning and then the bleeding stops but then over the next three weeks it goes through a repair process which involves scabs and pus and mm. bacteria and all of these kind of things if you don't know that you hit it with a hammer and you don't know what it's going to look like three weeks mm. later but you just take it on a tuesday and just go i don't want this anymore mm. then you just mess with this really amazing mechanism that's just doing it all mm. for us it's mm. doing all the repair process inside of us it's got i'm called a polish that's why i say polish and i love polish workers they work mm. really hard you got i got loads of polish workers in my building mm. doing loads of stuff Mm. And all I've got to do is I've got to get out the house. I've got to get out the way. So if I have an acute eliminative effort and I know why it's coming and I know why it's happened and I've burnt mm. myself out or I've pushed myself or I get injured, then I know what to do. Mm. And I find and I have patients who find and family who find that you can have enjoyment in understanding the pain that you go through to get mm. the healing. Mm. You get a sick feeling where you understand it. It's like, mm. great, this is the time where I really can relinquish. I can I can go and trip out in bed. I can mm. hallucinate. I can drift in and out of consciousness. Mm. And you can deal with pain. You can deal with vomiting. You can deal with aches and all of these things. Mm. And you kind of drift through this weird sense of consciousness. Mm. And then you come out the other side. And when you've done that over and over again from injuries or things that happen to you, mm. you just understand that these, mm. these things, the healing crisis, understand the healing crisis, spring that clean. That's a Leslie Thompson. Leslie Thompson, old school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So institute, yeah. you know. You know, the Incorporated Society of Registered Naturopaths, it is to the naturopathic world what the ICO is to the osteopathic world. Mm. I have these two, like, lovely people. I've got Nature mm. Cure and I've got Classical Osteopathy. Mm. And I look at the places like Lindlar that had the institution of osteopathy, the hospitals of osteopathy and Nature Cure. Mm. And they had everybody from diphtheria to meningitis to pneumonia. And I've got all of these books and my reference to these books when it mm. comes up, when you have a patient and it tells you what to do. Mm. And it's all the same. <laughs> the only thing is, you say, A, you've got to read it. B, you've yeah. got to believe it. Then you've yeah. got to test it. And then when you test it and you come out the other side and it works, you're just yeah. like the patient before. Like, yeah, yeah. I've just done it. I, I, yeah. I got through the fever with my kid. I got yeah. through the asthma attack without my medication. Yeah. I got through my migraine without the medication. Yeah. I even got through. I even got through the crisis without calling my mate Alex or Robert. Yeah, or yeah, yeah, they yeah. didn't come yeah. around and they didn't do this magic stuff. They do yeah. some stuff to my neck. They held my neck yeah. and they calmed me down and they yeah. made these presents yeah. and I think they even waved their arm above my chest. I did some <laughs> weird energetic stuff. Yeah. What am I going to do when they're not around? Yeah. No, we just we're just the for, we're just we're just helping the foreman in the body organize. Mm. We're just tailoring, we're just tinkering, we're just we're just adapting, we're just tending to the fire. 
We're not going in and throwing gasoline on the fire, on the bonfire, and we're not throwing water on it. We're not trying to blow it up, and we're not trying mm. to put it down. We're just sitting in the corner of the room and knitting. Mm. And it's having that, developing that trust in nature, isn't it? Absolutely. And that just comes, that comes with time. It comes mm. with doing it for yourself. It comes mm. doing it with patience. Or actually what it came with for me is it came with reading books where people have done it with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. Yeah. And then you've got to find someone like me or like mm. that or I found back then mm. that they're doing it with loads of people. Mm. And then you stand next to them whilst they're just talking to the other person down the line and going you can do it yourself yeah and no billy is not on the sofa mm. completely unconscious mm. with his eyes rolled to the back of his head and unresponsive and you're not like got a crystal in your hand going oh i really hope it's going to be okay because at those moments you can tend to the fire if the fire is getting too big you can kind mm. of push it in and you can tailor it if the fire is getting too small you can allow a bit more wood on the fire mm. you are you are managing you are adjusting you are mm. cooperating you're like you're doing all of these wonderful words that are all in there that we use mm. when we're looking at a patient to try and gently nudge them gently mm. nudge them and hold the space and it might be a day it might be two it might be a week mm. you know when the parents are like oh it's day four it's day four fever of like 41 mm. you know or when you've got your kids if they've if they've got measles or if they've got chicken let's let's not go down the measles route let's just go down the chicken pox route yeah no one gets vaccinations for chicken pox no one gets vaccinations for scarlet fever so what do you do when you got scarlet fever and chicken pox well, at least you don't have to like go down the route of whether you did or you didn't get vaccinated and whether you should or you shouldn't have got vaccinated because they don't have a vaccine for them. And so then even the medical side will be like, well, it will run its course. Mm. The best thing that we can do really is to maybe give you some stuff to bring the fever down. That will make you more comfortable. That will make Joey more comfortable. And you might all sleep a bit better. <laughs> Or we can give you something that we know pretty well kind of really suppresses that pretty well. So we just give a sort of broad spectrum antibiotic and we can give a bit as a steroid and it will really shut yeah. it down. But then you're not understanding the process of what a normal natural childhood illness is that's yeah. wrapped in developmental consequences. But you've just gone and like stuffed it and pushed it off to the side. <laughs> so if we go on things like coughs and colds where at least nowadays four years on you're not going to be locked in a room for two weeks because you've got a mm. cough mm. everybody's able to go out with a cough mm. and the fear that came with either someone's going to hear me coughing mm. has gone and we're all allowed to be ill again a little bit mm. alex and well, we we have been talking for a while, or you've been talking for a while. Yeah. <laughs> and just just to finish off this interesting chat, you know, what what advice? Because uh, Christmas is around the corner, yeah. And we have the 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 big wave of, uh, you know, calls and so on after Christmas, obviously. So, what what sort of advice would you give? You know, when we get sick in at the end of January, mid January. Okay. After eating all that sugar and protein during the yes. Christmas okay, time, so just 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 quick, just quickly with a couple of things because what's happening right now, like what's happening right now at this time of the year, is there's a big change of seasons. Hmm. Sun yeah. is dropping, and we don't have a lot of sunlight on our skin. The yes. general temperature is dropping, so the air temperature is colder, and it's a lot wetter generally. Hmm. When it's colder outside, and it's wetter, and it's darker, our skin goes into hibernation. The skin stops sweating. And when the skin stops sweating, the next mucous membranes, i.e. those of the lungs and the internal mucous membranes, the skin on the inside kick if they, they start the car again. OK, so at the moment, it's quite natural to have an increased mucosal elimination or a little bit of chestiness. Now, that might be the sore throats at the back. It might be a little bit of discharge coming out of the throat or it might be coming out of the like, associated with a cough and coming out of the lung tissues. But it's quite normal at this time of year. It happens as the seasons change and it happens as your skin goes into regression and the other organs pick up another way of looking at this when you go to fireworks night or people who have been going around recently 
think that, you know, in the summertime when your top's off and you're in the garden and it's really hot and the heat wave's there or you go on holiday and you're sweating all the time and you very rarely go for a pee. And then you get to like cold fireworks night when you go out and you get a bit shivery and a bit cold and suddenly you really need to go to the loo. You get, yeah. you, you get urgency. Your body goes into a limit because your kidney is taken over in the summer and the heat and you're active, you're sweating. So you get rid of it through there. But you go through cold and your body closes down the skin and your kidneys need to. So you're suddenly peeing a lot. So one of these things is just to simply at this time of year, try and keep your skin alive. Try and go out, try and do some form of activity which makes you sweat every now and then. And as you sweat, you'll just keep your skin breathing. If you're cold and you're going out, you can just put an extra layer on or a waterproof layer on and you could go for a five, ten minute power walk. You don't have to be running. You can just go for a power walk down the road. You can wear an extra woolly jumper and then you can come in and whilst you're making, pouring yourself a drink and you're getting ready to jump into the shower and you really are hot because you've now come in and you just feel your T-shirt inside sweating and soaking. Then you go to the shower and you take that all off. You jump in the shower and you give yourself a clean and you clean all of that sort of metabolic waste off your skin. So you keep your skin alive. But just notice that at the moment there's that change in the temperature, there's the change in the light, and there's the change in the leaves. All of the leaves are dropping on the tree out there. And so there's less oxygen and there's less carbon dioxide being removed. So there's more carbon in the air. There's more sort of detritus. There's more sort of waste products in the air. So that kicks off at the same time. Um, going into the winter time, it just makes sense, doesn't it, that we're reducing the external toxic load on the body so try and eat healthily it's number one isn't it you know try and eat clean eat green um try and eat more plant-based foods try and eat organic if you don't know why you're eating organic or you don't have much money and you don't have much money to spend on organic food well then google the clean 15 and you'll get the 15 most unsprayed foods that are out there and those are the foods that have the least amount of pesticides and chemicals on them. And so you don't have to necessarily spend all your money on an organic melon or an organic avocado because the skins are so tight that the actual um, toxic matter on the inside is less important. But the same as doing the clean 15, you can also look at the dirty dozen and the dirty dozen will give you a list of the dozen most highly sprayed foods. So things like leaves and celery and berries, those are all the ones, for example, some of the top ones. So if you're going to buy organic and you can buy organic, buy organic. If you don't have so much money, look up those ones because they're the ones high vitamin C's, high vitamins, high mineral content, high water content. Those are all good things that the body needs in order to A, function and B, eliminate. Try and get some sun on your body, even if there's no vitamin D at the moment and the UVB rays are not strong enough to produce vitamin D in your body. So even if you're here and it's sunny on a Christmas day, like we quite often have here still in the UK and you're sitting in the in the greenhouse or whatever, and you might be sweaty or you might be still hot, there's not the rays in there to produce vitamin D. And you need vitamin D in order to absorb calcium. So if you're a breastfeeding mum, and you want to keep your bone and your teeth health, then take a vitamin D3 supplement through the winter, especially if you're above certain latitudes where there's just we're going into now six months of vitamin D miss. So keep some sunlight or take a vitamin D supplement. Drink enough water and think of investing in a water purifier so you're not taking extra hormones and chemicals in your water. Eat green, eat clean, eat fruity, eat vegetably. And try and reduce all of the other things that have loads of lists on the back of them with ingredients. If you are mucus, yeah, particularly if you, got, if you don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you are going through an acute inflammation, if you are suffering with your skin or your mucus membranes, then I would generally suggest that you should back off dairy, so but butter, cheese, and milk. And um, I would also remove gluten. I would remove lactose and gluten that tend to be a little bit stufflier and they produce glue in the body. And so when you've got really snotty noses and you've got blocked ears and you've got all of these kind of things, even if you don't want to be plant based or whatever, just back off those foods. And especially with the dairy, if you are going to consume it, then make sure that you're having biodynamic and organic and don't have too much of it because you don't need it because they are very mucus forming. Um, 
get enough movement so that you are able to sweat through your skin at some times. There's been enough demonstrable um, experiments where they looked at the quality and the toxic load of the sweat in your uh, that comes out of your skin when either you a do physical exercise or b sit in a sauna and when you do physical exercise the amount of toxicity or toxic byproducts or meta metabolic waste or things that are in the skin is much much higher than when you're sweating just through heat production so produce the heat from inside of you through doing activity and you will you will eliminate you will smell and you will produce more from the inside but you need to be able to rest and sleep more. Rest and sleep is your recuperation. And so don't be fooled by the fact that you've got electricity in your house and try to go to bed earlier. And try not to look at, you know, not try not to be under fake lighting, looking at screens for long periods of time deep into the night because you will become exhausted. So conserve your energy. Go and see an osteopath, ideally a classical osteopath who will look at the but your spine and tinker with it like you've got a professional guitar or piano tunist or a mechanic to come and look at those organs. And they will be able to find lesions in your spine and they will find knots and areas in your spine that they understand more than you do. And they can release them, they can oscillate them, they can integrate them and articulate them. And those things will then work better in the circuitry that is your spine. Find ways of being happy. Try and understand any trauma that you're going through. Sometimes it's worthwhile shouting and writing to your MP. And sometimes it's not worth looking at the news late at night because it's just so horrific. That is not to remove the things that are happening in the world and not to stop people standing up. But it is to stop yourself getting very, very sick and not feeling very well. So do the right thing. Act but sometimes distract. Mm. Um, and just try and remove as much of the toxic byproducts, the stuff that we sometimes crave, especially when under emotional distress, but it's hard to stop and try and get it out of the house. So try and remove those things after Halloween and try and remove those things after Christmas and try and remove those things after Easter that you know aren't massively health promoting. And you might be in a family like us where you try and remove those things if they've gone out with their friends and you you, you provide alternative healthy old thingies. Or you might not worry about it so much, but you might just think this is not the beginning of a slippery slope that just continues on. And yeah, start with those processes. And again, go back. You can listen to some of those other podcasts that we've talked about where we just look at the nature of these different elements. But with this one, what we're trying to say is sometimes when you have a cough and you have a cold, it's not a bad thing. And if you crawl into bed and you have to drink water for a bit and you have to turn the phone off and the kid doesn't go to school for a couple of days or you just have to miss a couple of days worth of work and you lie in bed feeling rotten for yourself, but you understand that there's a process in the body. If you need a little bit of support, then get hold of me or get hold of one of you guys and just say, I'm not feeling great. Is this okay? And we will ask you and make sure that you're not going in a disease crisis. We will make sure that this is not something that you have overcooked yourself and you don't have the vitality and you've taken some form of poisoning and you've taken some form of something that we need to help you get it out. And that will give you the psychological support you need to deal with yourself. And you've got to find someone like me or like you guys that can help hold their hands when someone that they love, i.e. their little ones, are going through it, to stop them palliating it with pharmacological medicine. And once you then allow them to go through their first fever, and as I say to my friends or my patients, you got your wings, you got your like, you got your fever wings. Mm. Oh, you got your skin hives or wings. <laughs> you get badges. Because once you've got one of those badges, you know it. And we all know what it feels like to have one of those really achy sacrums when your eyes are burning and they feel hot and pressured in your head and you feel a bit wobbly and your taste in your mouth. We know that, don't we? We know that feeling in our eyes and in our brain and in our mouth and in our sacrum. And that is saying, 
I'm doing something and I'm taking over and you've got no choice about it. So allow that internal organism and that foreman to do what it's necessary. Make a check in your head and work out, have you been burning the candle? Mm. Are you going through a healing crisis? Is this because you've just had the last Christmas party and you knew you were tired and you knew you shouldn't go out and drink loads of booze and doing stuff, but you just had to. And then you've woken up the following day and you are ill. And it's not because of anything other than you just didn't listen to the warning signs of your body. And it will take a bit longer than it would have done if you didn't go out to that last two parties and you stopped and you took a bit of control. But sometimes we push life and sometimes it happens. So don't be mean on yourself. Don't be crazy. Just know that your body understands it much better than you do. Mm. And if you don't want to end up with long C or long or I've never felt so I don't feel well because that thing happened to me a while back that I took a load of medicine for and I'm still suffering months and years on. Mm. It's because there's been an incomplete job done and your body might need to go back there and just replaster that wall that didn't dry properly before you painted it. Mm. And you painted over it and you made it look okay, but it wasn't actually okay. And so the body will go back. And so when it goes back and it starts it again, then maybe you're in a better scenario to do it. And if you do take some stuff to suppress it, then do your best to try and make as healthy choices as you can afterwards. And just realize that you suppress the fire, but the fire was there for a reason. And if you can then um, bolster it, you get a much better chance. And if you go into this time of year and you try and think, OK, I know it's going to be Christmas. I know I will drink loads of drink. I know I will eat all the foods that don't agree with me. So I'm really going to try my best to try and instigate <clears throat> healthful practices now so that when I get to January, I am just about okay. I'll be tired and I'll be knackered and I'll be done with my family or whatever, but I'll be okay. But it won't be the time where you stop, you go home, and then you have a major acute crisis. And those things happen, don't they? They happen around Christmas. They happen in the depths of winter. And it's not just one named type thing that's out there. It is universal and it always happens. That's why it's seasonal. So be as healthy as you can. And understand the process. And if you need any help, get hold of one of us. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for your time uh, this Very evening. Good. I really enjoyed that. I expect you did as well, Diego. Oh yeah, definitely. I always love listening to 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 all these different mm. philosophy and principles. And you know, it's it's great. It, it goes so well with what we do on a daily basis. Mm. So thank you, Alex. Thank you. Mm. Pleasure. My absolute pleasure. It's really like nice to be here, guys, and nice to tackle some, you know, just again, there's loads of different topics, isn't there? Mm. With all of these, they're different topics. And the thing is, is as well, the, the, the you know, the last thing I leave with is modern day osteopathic teaching. And even when 20 years ago, when I was at the ICO, it was weekends. Mm. And those weekends generally have to be reduced to mechanical principles because we are in a mechanical profession. We understand the physiological consequences of those mechanics and it's extremely complicated, but we might only be doing weekend courses. Mm. And originally, way back when, they were entire years and courses worth of osteopathy and nature cure. So mm. we had not just this hour and a half tonight or whatever, but you had an hour and a half every day or mm -hmm. two hours or five hours of acute chronic and chronic and diet and fasting and hydrotherapy and fevers and management and all of these different things from mucus through to blood, through to germs, through to viruses. And it's taken me 23 years worth of ingesting this information so that it just just keeps coming out and there's no sort of end to it and there's no question it doesn't mean that i don't stand up and i gotta like think to myself when there are really serious things happening mm. but it becomes so inbuilt in you that you just trust it but it mm. does mean that even to the people coming out of modern day osteopathic colleges and then doing the ico things that there's a breadth of information through dietetics, through fev fevers, through all of this stuff mm. that was day-to-day -day stuff and it was day in, day out. So it is a lot of information. Mm. The more you keep plugging away at all of these different subjects, 
it basically means not only are you reaching towards the health, but when your health has a little blip or you have an accident or you have an acute crisis or you deal with life, you know what to do because it's not mm. what you do when you're feeling good. It's what you do when you're feeling bad mm. that really counts. And that's the scary stuff. And it's the stuff that we don't like, but it's the most important on the journey towards fulfilling your true potential. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank Cheers. you. Thanks, Alex. One, Thank you very much. One thing I would just like to say uh, before we finish, um, if you'd like any further information about the Institute of Classical Osteopathy, please do visit our website at www.classical-osteopathy.org. And also, don't forget, we're having our first face-to-face -face conference for since, uh, was it March 2020, I think, wasn't it, Diego? Yes, definitely. Ask, uh, so we're, we're having our first face-to-face -face conference next year for our 70th anniversary. Uh, so we're really excited about that. It's going to be a fantastic two days. And Alex is going to be there uh, with us as well, which is going to be... I'm going to be making people do some fun stuff in the yeah. break. So, yeah, if you want to come <laughs> meet. And can I, can I also say, just to put in there, just to plug, because sometimes you don't know who to call. If you go on my, my website with mine and my wife is myhealthandhappiness.co.uk, myhealthandhappiness.co.uk. Yeah. It's got an osteopathic area. It's got a lifestyle stroke nature cure area. It's got podcast areas like this. It's got contact details. If you want more information, if you need some help, if you want some support, just please get hold of me. Mm. If you want a bit of silly, fun inspiration, you can follow me at Nature Cure Family, all one word, Nature Cure Family on Instagram. Um, so you can get hold of me on there or just see some just helpful little tips or just to make you smile and giggle at someone being silly every now and then. Uh -huh. But yeah, get it, get, get in contact you, with us. You do have some yeah, good there, pictures on there, Alex. There we go. <laughs> yeah, I'll go down there. So yeah, if, you need it, if you need any support, I'm there and really willing to, to help in any way I can. Brilliant. Right. Thank you very much. I'll